scripture portion for the sermon this morning is from uh, Psalm 103. Psalm 103, verses 8 to verse 17. We will read this portion responsibly. A very familiar psalm. Kirtana Nuta Mudo Kirtana. Enimido Vachnam in Chirvairon, Erundo Vachnam, sorry, Padiheda Vachnam Varku, Uttara Pratitram Chadukunam. Chala Parchema into Nabagam. Marie Kluptamga. Marie. Idina Vaki Parchira Korku, Devnya Kavaki and Chadukini, and Vaip Chuskini, Pradhana Purkunga, and Martel Pundkoal Nashpurthunan. Psalm 103, verse 8 to verse 17. Let's read it responsibly. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and plenteous in mercy. He will not always chide, neither will he keep his anger forever. He hath not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. Like a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. Verse 14, for he knoweth our frame, he remembereth that we are dust. As for man, his days are as grass, as a flower of the field, so he flourisheth. Verse 16, for the wind passeth over it, and it is gone, and the place thereof shall know it no more. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear him, and his righteousness unto children's children. Let us pray and look to the Lord. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you. We praise you for enabling us to come together around your precious word and consider your heart this morning and your thoughts as we long to receive thy precious voice to speak to our lives. Lord, unable as I am here in enough myself to do anything, Father, I pray that you would speak through me to me to each one of us this morning. I pray also, Lord, uh, that you would minister not only in receiving of your word, but, Lord, making us to, into becoming all that you long us to become as your people. We pray that you would bless, Lord, uh, our hearing, Lord, uh, and, uh, Lord, may our lives be enabled to to be those that would uh, have you, our Heavenly Father, become so real in our lives to have you, Lord, and your likeness be seen in us. We ask that you would bless us. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. I want to take my opportunity as well to wish all of my brothers here uh, for a happy Father's Day. And uh, all the fathers and the would-be fathers that are here, I thank the Lord, uh, and I, I also want to wish you. Um, and uh, I promised to the uh, church that uh, on Mother's Day, that if the Mother's Day sermon is centered to our fathers and children, uh, the Father's Day sermon would be to preach hard on mothers and children, right? I, I'm trying to keep up my promises, as though, although I fail, only God is the one who makes and keeps the promises. But I'm trying. So I'm trying to keep that by preaching hard today on the mothers and children. So the fathers get to relax, but they get to their, have their portion as well. Um, and uh, when I come to this Father's Day, often uh, we, might, uh, <clears throat> we might come to be carried away uh, with gifts, although I like Brother uh, Manasseh's ideas. Uh, very nice, uh, as uh, I heard uh, that uh, there was a, a, a family who had, uh, the husband was hearing uh, his wife complain so much about having multiple trips to, um, to, this, uh, to this place where the clothes are pressed and uh, dry cleaning place actually, and uh, she's having these multiple trips and she was getting a little uh, stressed out. And so after hearing that, the father, uh, the husband 
actually happened to get uh, an iron pressing board for the Mother's Day gift. <laughs> and uh, soon after, anyway, after May comes June, the Father's Day comes, right? So the, the wife then received that gift. She didn't say anything. And on the Father's Day, she brought an ironing stand, actually, <laughs> a board, ironing board, and gave it as a Father's Day gift. It seems. So many things happen in payback and uh, of uh, what gifts we receive, but uh, Brother's idea is excellent. We can't beat it buying our own gift, actually. Uh, but the greatest gift that we actually have received is that fathers are not called to reinvent the wheel or neither try to figure out what it is to be a godly father. He, uh, as a father, as an, as an individual, is not left clueless or not even left without any uh, idea of what it is. But he is given a grand calling. A father is given a grand and a great calling to be an imitator of his heavenly father. Um, and uh, when I come to this portion, Psalm 103, this portion, Psalm 103, is like uh, the peak of all the range of mountains that you would find in, in uh, David as he penned this psalm. Um, one of this psalm, I mean, most often this could be one among our favorite psalms, right? We all by heart this psalm because of the aspects of... Um, of uh, attributes of God that we get to see here in how it relates so wonderfully to each of our lives. And uh, David, as he penned this psalm, he gives to us in the first five verses his personal blessings of how he has experienced the Lord. There are many who's that you would find in, uh, as he calls out to bless the Lord. We were given this invitation in our worship time to bless the Lord or worship or uh, give praise to God for all that he is. And David takes stock in verses 3 to 5 about at least five who's that he says, who forgiveth, who healeth, who redeemeth, who crowneth, who satisfieth. And at least these five personal experiences of how God has come to be in his life. And all of us, who would not cherish for having such a great God who gives us all these wondrous things. And so David certainly had penned this psalm of worship in such a personal way. And not only in a personal way, in a, in a general way, our Lord is a, a God who has some precious, wondrous attributes that we would start to see from verse 6. He's a righteous God. He's a just God who executes righteousness and judgment. And uh, in verse 8, we find that the Lord is merciful, gracious. There are many attributes of our God that are called out in this psalm. And uh, from verses 6 to verse 17, David goes on to give in general how the Lord, in his working with people all over the world, how he reveals his attributes, how his attributes are revealed. And so... I'm not going to focus on all of those attributes. I'm not here to even exposit this particular section. That's not, uh, there's only one phrase that captivated me that actually amazed me, and uh, which is where my sermon is centered around today in Psalm 103, verse 13, where you might also find it interesting um, when you read this, if you pause and think with me. Psalm 103, verse 13, we find, like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. By the way, this word pity can be taken into two extremes. Like whenever we think of pity, we think of our beggars who don't deserve uh, being given something as arms in the pity, in the sad state of affairs that we find them. And that's not the kind of pity or the expression being talked here, if you find it in an NLT version, you would read the word compassion. Compassion. Uh, that is probably the right expression um, where we see, like as a father that has compassion upon his children, 
so the Lord has compassion upon them that fear him. I want to bring to us this compassionate father. Um, and uh, not only to highlight about who our God is in his compassion, in the, in the clear expression that we would find in the Bible, but also how in particular as a family, we see that fathers are called to this great calling to be compassionate fathers. And I want us as uh, mothers and children, whoever you might be here, to take stock of this such a high calling that a father has and come along their side and aid them. Because this calling is no way uh, close to have them be able to do them, do it by their own strength or even in, in an easy way. Because whenever you think about compassion, isn't it that it, you think about a mom? Even the Bible acknowledges that. Turn with me to Isaiah 49. Remember this verse in chapter 49, verse 15? Isaiah 49, verse 15, the Lord himself says, Can a woman forget her suckling child, sucking child that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? A woman are the ones generally known for compassion. Father are no, fathers are known for firmness. Fathers are known for discipline or, or uh, taking, I mean, when you read about don't spare the rod and spoil the child, it is the fathers that are thought about. It's also for the mothers as well. <laughs> but usually that is the portion of the fathers and to show compassion is the portion of the mothers because it naturally comes for them and uh, fathers naturally can show their firmness and disciplinary uh, uh, actions or even show that uh, that, uh, that kind of a, a face so that they can be afraid of as, as the children. So when we think about this, to have a father be a compassionate father is not an easy task at all. And in that, there is a comparison being made here. Take note of the other surprise thing. I always thought, many a times, uh, Father's Day can be a mixed experience or a mixed feeling for some uh, just like me, if you have uh, had your father in the last year and not this year, it can be a mixed feeling of how can I celebrate Father's Day with my father not here. But uh, I want to have us take note that in, in various ways, uh, I particularly wanted to celebrate Father's Day in, in exclusively preaching on Father's, uh, father, the topic of Father's Day because my father was called home to be with the Lord. Uh, not that I don't love my dad. I, I love him dearly. I miss him. Uh, I, I, God has given an excellent father. I, I take stock of that. But, but the fact is that many times this is the trend in Christianity. Sadly, if somebody is not well in Christmas time or if somebody uh, has passed away during the Jan 1st or during a, a birthday time of theirs, they don't celebrate that anymore. That's the pagan kind of a culture. We don't have to subscribe to it. Christmas is Christmas whether anybody is there or not, in the sense that the gospel of Christ coming into this world is real. And Father's Day is Father's Day, no matter whether I have my father in person or not, because of a heavenly father who is the perfect heavenly father. And so, as I was just mentioning, that the it can be a mixed kind of a feeling for us who have our fathers or who have a good fathers, godly fathers. It's a, a day of celebration where we can praise God for such godly fathers. And if there is uh, an ungodly fatherhood uh, that was there in our home or someone who didn't model godliness well, Father's Day can be a difficult day for them because they don't want to remember their relationship with their fathers. And so often we come to, whether it be Father's Day or to this verse, as the verse itself says, in a wrong way. What is the wrong way I want to see? Uh, I want to have us take note. And the verse actually says that, like a father having compassion or pity on his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. Take note, if you find an earthly father, 
not having compassion, as this verse says, then you have a wrong understanding of the compassionate God. And so, sometimes, Father's Day or fathers can actually have a wrong example in such a way that we don't actually show the true nature and the character of a great, perfect, loving, heavenly Father that we all have. And uh, just to have us uh, turn, the, turn the lens around, actually it is if the fathers are able to be compassionate as the Lord is, what a wondrous picture that would be, right? And uh, notice that our Lord is, when Moses in Exodus chapter 34, when Moses asks uh, for a seeing of God, to having a personal encounter with God, uh, to see his glory in Exodus chapter 33, Moses desires of it and Moses in fact demands it and says, I want it, Lord, I want to see your glory. And God says, no flesh can be alive seeing my full glory. And to that, Moses' request is not denied because he had this passion. He had this desire to see the glory of God. Whether he lives or dies, so was his desire. And so God says, I'm going to do one thing. I see your desire. I'm going to let my glory be revealed, not the full extent, but a partially. And he says in Exodus chapter 34, turn with me to Exodus chapter 34, verse 6, as God gives a glimpse of his glory between the cleft of the rock, we all know how God as he passes by in 34 chapter verse 6 Exodus, and the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth keeping the mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children, unto the third and to the fourth generation. You know, Moses' response was amazing. In verse 8, he says, And Moses made haste and bowed his head toward the earth and worshipped. You know, when you see the the glimpse of God's glory, you'll fall and worship Him. And in that glimpse, what God reveals is His graciousness, His compassion, His long-suffering, His mercifulness. That's what is proclaimed there. When the first glimpse of the glory that Moses sees, and as he passed by, in verse 5 we read, God has proclaimed the name of the Lord, meaning, God actually reveals His nature by His names. We find that throughout the pages of the Bible. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord who provides. Jehovah Nisi, the Lord is our victory. Jehovah Shamma, He is right there, present. Jehovah Sidkenu, His righteousness. He is a righteous God. All those names reveal His very nature. And here, in the glimpse of glory that was given to Moses, I would say, God the compassionate is being given as a full display of the glory, not the full display, the partial glory that was seen here. The side that God shows off here to Moses is God the compassionate. If there is anyone who is truly compassionate, it is God. That's why we find not only Moses seeing that in Isaiah as well, the verse that we see, can a woman forget her sucking child that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? Yea, though, yea, they may forget, yet will I not forget thee. The compassion of a woman is in such lesser degree as com compared to the great compassion of this great God. And the Father's calling, as we take note here in Psalm 103, verse 13, is to be a compassionate father. We are known well for our firmness. We are known well for our discipline or to be able to handle our children. Sometimes out of anger or sometimes out of so much of, uh, I should say, 
overwhelming love, so much so that we don't discipline them at all. We don't even say a word sometimes. In both extremes are not right. We need to have the right compassion. I mean, when a child is going astray, there's no, there's no blessing or compassion in trying to love them to let them go astray. We do have compassion to see that they don't go astray. And that is the calling of a heavenly father. And so here in Psalm 103, here is a calling of a father to be a compassionate father. Because God says, as a father has compassion, so the Lord has compassion on them that fear him. And when God wants to compare, as inspired by the Holy Spirit of God, as David writes this psalm, the calling that God has given to us as fathers is to be a compassionate father. And what does it mean to be compassionate? There are two words that actually give to us that picture. Take note in the verses that we read, Psalm 103, verses 8 onwards. We find there are three things that are so great or so described in, in this aspect called so. Let's try to get those three things. One, verse 8, we see he's so slow to anger. A God is a God who is so slow to anger. That's why we read in Psalm 103 verse 8, The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and plenteous in mercy. Many times we fathers, at times, it depends on the mood. I mean, the day happens and the work day, if it was good, we had a good day, we just did our work, we delivered our product, we are getting into a mode of vacation, our children also know that, actually. They know when to rightly ask, whether it be gift or whether it be a treat or something. They see our attire, our, our expressions, and they kind of catch us uh, to ask rightly. Sometimes, we ourselves are not cognizant of what mood we are in. <laughs> and so, in a wrong time, if a child comes or if a spouse comes and asks something, there is this uh, instant kindling of... Uh, uh, of boiling point that gets reached, right? And uh, I was remembering this. Uh, a science teacher asked, asked uh, a student in the class, what is the boiling point of water? And the student said, when my father gets angry. <laughs> so the thing is that there is such quickness to become angry that is there at times in us as fathers. Not so much sometimes in mothers. Sometimes mothers as well can be. But God wants us to learn of how he's slow to anger. Oh, think about the number of times where his wrath should have come upon us right away for the heinous kinds of sins in our past that God has been so merciful. And yet he was so slow to anger that he didn't destroy us in our sin but had mercy and plenteous, not little, plenteous in mercy. And when I say this, I'm not here to highlight the weakness of we as fathers, but I'm also here to urge mothers or, or children to take note that we are not perfect. Many times, when it comes to the calling of a father, there's this grave danger that we are, from, our child, from the childhood of the children, the children look up to the fathers as their heroes. Oh, my father can do anything. Oh, he can bring the moon down or like we can... He, they have this idea that our fathers, fathers are the perfect, can-do-everything kind of people. And we as fathers sometimes can be trying to keep that image of that in them. Though we fail, we don't give the side where we fall onto having them see our own vulnerability. And in that, we might give a false image to them that we are perfect fathers. Sadly, there's only one perfect father. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 45, we read, just as your heavenly father is perfect. Be ye perfect, right? We are trying, we are called, but uh, there's only one perfect father. That is our heavenly father. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 45. That ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. Sorry, I'm reading a wrong verse. Um, 
in verse 48. Be ye therefore perfect as even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. He alone is perfect. We are, we are work in progress people. And so we are called to take note that we have this high calling and uh, one of the ways that we as fathers can grow to be compassionate fathers in the calling is to be so slow to anger as our God is. We are called to learn that as those who have come to know the Lord. And if you have not known the Lord, there is no capability of you to learn this. Because unless you have personally experienced that mercy and slowness to anger in recognizing your own sinfulness and have received that forgiveness, you cannot learn it. It cannot be manufactured. And so the first aspect that we see is being so slow to anger. Not only slow, slow to anger, in verse 11 we read, For as the heaven is high above the earth, Psalm 103 verse 11, For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. Not only so slow to anger, so great is his mercy. Many times as uh, we find this act of disciplining that is required in our families, right? Sometimes mom say it's your turn, now he needs discipline. As though that's only the father's uh, uh, responsibility. I've told whatever I have to say. He's not listening to me, now you discipline him. And right now you have to discipline him sometimes. <laughs> the pressure will be there. The point is that it's not easy to discipline for you or for us as fathers, but don't put them in a, line, in a hot spot to have them discipline them at the time that you want them to discipline them. Give them to show mercy also. Here, we are called, our calling is not only to be so slow to anger, but also to be so great in mercy, just like our Heavenly Father is. And if you and I have received mercy, you and I would learn to extend that mercy to our children. I mean, they don't deserve sometimes getting what they ask, but we still give them, and that's an opportunity to show mercy. And uh, that is one thing that we see. The second thing that we see is so great in mercy, so slow to anger, so great in mercy. Verse 12, as far as east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions, from us. In all these three souls, so slow to anger, so great in mercy, so far he removed our transgressions, God shows what it is to be a compassionate father. He displays truly how compassionate he is, so plenteous in mercy and compassion. And the expression of compassion is this. Um, it is expressed to be something that comes out of the belly itself. There's a movement in the belly that makes us to be so captivated to show our love and our mercy and all that expression that we are moved to it. That's the kind of expression that compassion is. You know, Jesus had that in Matthew chapter 9, Matthew chapter 9, verse 36. Jesus was such a good shepherd. Matthew chapter 9 verse 36. In a in few minutes I'll close, but please follow me quickly. Matthew chapter 9 verse 36. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. This expression of compassion is something that moves us. It we cannot be in the same place. We have to do something. It comes out of the belly. And that's the expression that Jesus had. And uh, in of ourselves, we cannot cultivate this. When we see the kind of God, the Heavenly Father that we have, when we see the kind of shepherd that we have, our Lord Jesus Christ, who is moved with compassion to, towards His sheep that we are, you and I can learn that attribute from this great God and see that this calling in of ourselves we fail but by God's grace and the support from the family whether it be the spouse or children 
to do their part sometimes children know how to how to trigger us to be uh to sh- to bring out our anger they know the touch points and uh they can trigger us to be brought us to anger and we sometimes can be quick and as fathers we are called to learn the so slow to anger so great in mercy so far hath he removed our transgression when we can't remove anybody's transgression our children's we can lead them to somebody who can remove their transgressions and uh, the calling of a father is to encourage godliness in the home whether it be our children or spouses and when you as a spouse or a, or a child are going to take that upon yourself to grow in godliness it makes the father's calling to be easy to show compassion and to be that godly man uh, in the house now quickly i want to have one more word not only this so word the second word i want to have us take note before i close is this word called fear him as we see in psalm 103 verse 13 like a father pitieth his children so the lord pitieth them that fear him a god is a god who longs us to grow in fearing him he's a consuming fire the bible says in hebrews chapter 10 the last verse he's a consuming fire yes he's a compassionate god but he longs us to be god fearing and he says that he pitieth or he shows compassion on them that fear him this uh, fear that god expects us to have towards him is not a terrifying fear the children of israel had that terrifying fear we find in exodus chapter 19 when god calls them to come to be into that covenantal people that kings and priests onto the rest of the whole nation creation he calls them to the exclusive calling to be that nation set apart they say moses you go you go and listen to god and tell whatever he says we can't come oh he's so terrifying that's not the kind of fear that god wants us to have yes he can be terrifying because he is a holy god he is a just god and in his presence there is no sin that can be entertained he deals with sin with uh, with wrath and anger he is angry with sinners every day and because of his anger you and i can get into a terrifying fear but that's not the fear that the lord expects us as his children us us as his people to have he calls us not as a those that would have a terrifying fear but a, a reverential fear a reverential fear where there is this due honor that is always there in our minds in our actions in our words that we constantly give to him and acknowledge him as to who he is and so this fear that we find is mentioned again three times in verse 11 verse 13 and verse 17 in the portion that we read verse 11 he says sami says for as heaven is high above the earth so great is his mercy toward them that fear him god shows his mercy but god extends that to those that fear him when we come to this reverential fear of how holy he is how honorable he is and yet how loving he is that he has dealt of our sin on the cross of calvary in his son to take all that wrath for our sake and when we come to into that reverential fear we obtain mercy and we as fathers are also called to be those that would give that god fearing lives to our our family members in in encouraging them to have that god fearing lives and so here he gives mercy to those that fear him he shows compassion to those that fear him in verse 13 and verse 17 uh, let's read verse 17 and then we'll close but the mercy of the lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear him and his righteousness unto children's children the calling of us as fathers is not only upon 
us to take care of our children, which is the first thing, but extended even to children's children, it seems. He wants us to have such God-fearing life, whereby the righteousness would be extended to our children's and to our children's children. That God-fearing life is to be modeled in us, in our life, and to be seen in our children, and also to our children's children, that that righteousness would be passed on from generations to generations. We find that the scripture gives to us a calling, which is godliness with contentment is great gain. Us as fathers can be so lost in this calling to be providing for the family, so lost in earning for the family, so lost in uh, making sure all the needs of the family, even luxurious needs, not luxurious needs, there's nothing as luxurious needs, right? <laughs> we need wants, wishes to be satisfied. But God is calling us as those of our fathers to have this godly lives so that we live out a life that is godliness with contentment. We are called to be content with what God gives to us and not be lost in only one side of the calling in earning for the family, but not being there. The time that needs to be given to our children, the time for family prayer, the time to discipline or to converse with them, not discipline in a, in a rod way, but also in an instructional way, in a loving way, to converse with them, to give to them positive enforcement and instruction is also a calling of the father. Many a times, only the calling of earning for the family, buying good things for the family or gifts is only seen, sadly. But not just that, but the other side, which is godliness with contentment, is great gain. When they see us as fathers are content with what is given, what we have, not longing for higher things, and they see that godliness in us, and they see that God-fearing life in us, and us our children learn from us. They don't learn what we teach them. They see what we have in us and learn from what we have in us. And so we need to model that godliness. We need to give that godliness as a gift. And that is the God-fearing life that we can pass on to them. And so as we have that passed on to our children, it's also our children's it's also the father's calling to see that godliness being passed on, that righteousness being passed on to our children's children. Oh, when you as moms and when you as child think about it, you ought to pity the fathers. It is an immense calling of the responsibility of the highest order to see that this righteousness is passed on to our next and next generation. And when you and I have such a calling, we are called to do everything, not in our strength, but relying on our Heavenly Father. We have not in ourselves to do what God has called us to. And so God calls us to grow in His likeness by leaning on Him, by depending on Him, by drawing strength from Him, and also taking the support from the family. And... Uh, being that one who would reinforce godliness with contentment so that the righteousness can be passed on to generations that are to come. And so as a, compa as a calling that you and I have for a compassionate father, may we model, may we imitate. We read one verse and then pray. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 1. Paul gives to us in first three chapters about all the great gospel and uh, the principle the, uh, the proclamation of all that God did in Christ Jesus for us. And then from chapter 4, he gives to us all that now you and I are to do. If the first three chapters is doctrine, the next three chapters is duty. Um, if the first three chapters is, is about all that God did, if chapter 4 onwards is about what we are to do. And he puts this verse in chapter 5, verse 1, that what we are called to do is not something to reinvent the wheel. It is a mere imitation. It is a copying. 
And you and I, in chapter 5, verse 1, Paul gives this exhortation and says, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. To be a compassionate father, as, as God calls us, is an impossible task. But in Christ, what is impossible is made possible because of all that God has worked out in Christ Jesus. And he leaves to us, to those for us that we be just imitators, those that would be followers and do what God has done in modeling that godliness to us. And so when we take note of this high calling, we are called as fathers to be that such compassionate fathers, to model godliness and to see that righteousness is passed on to generations to come. May the Lord bless us to do so in the days that are ahead and uh, have us be such imitators and uh, that the Lord be glorified in our lives in and through our lives. Let's pray. Loving Heavenly Father, we thank you. We praise you for this precious privilege that you have given to us to once again, Lord, uh, remember the compassion of yours and also, Lord, the graciousness of yours in how it pleased thee, Lord, when we were destined to destruction in the wrath that was to come upon us, in the anger, righteous anger that needs to come upon us. You had dealt with us in your mercy, Lord, and have brought us into your fold to know you, a loving Heavenly Father that thou art. And as fathers, and as families, you have called us, Lord, to model godliness and how in of our strength we fail. But in your grace and mercy, we are sustained. We are provided for all the resources that we need. And here we are, Lord, as fathers and also as uh, individuals, Father. We pray that you would uh, make this our very portion to have our families be filled with righteousness unto generations to come and that our lives would be modeled after godly fear, a reverential fear for who you are and honor you for who you are always. Father, that uh, we would live out to be a compassionate fathers, Lord, uh, that we would model godliness and compassion in your likeness, Father. And we thank you, Lord, for being such a perfect, loving, heavenly Father that you are. And we pray that you would so, Lord, uh, bless this word and uh, all the families and each of us, Lord, uh, to have our lives be blessed to live out your word. We thank you, we praise you for your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, who has, Lord, uh, poured forth all things for godliness in our lives. Lord, we ask that you would be with us through the rest of our day. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, love of the Father, communion of Holy Spirit, rest and abide with us, both now and forevermore. Amen.